So let's start with natural language processing. And whenever you want to start with natural language, the question is, how are you going to represent the words in the language? For us, as human, we understand what a word is, and we understand it in an intuitive fashion. But when you want to talk to a computer, the computer needs to know what is a word and how to represent it. The computers only understand numbers. And I'm going to start with this paper, Distributed Representation of Words and Phrases and Their Compositionality, and it's going to lead to word to vec. So we are going to transform a word to a vector. Now here is a question for you. How would you represent distributed or of or words or and phrases in a computer? Well, representations makes me think of mapping into matrices. Okay, so first thing first, you are creating a dictionary. Okay, that's good. And in your dictionary, you could say, this is my first word, this is my second word, this is my third word, fourth, five. Now these are numbers, yes? One, two, three, four, five, six up until the size of your vocabulary. But is this a good representation? Uh, no, because the computer will see number six greater than number one, for example, so we'll assume that, um, yeah, so on. Yes, that's one problem. The other problem is uh, we usually, as human, understand words in context. So it matters where distributed is sitting. It matters where there is. It matters where computer compositionalities in a sentence. It's neighborhood words matter. If you represent them with one, two, three, four, five, six, yes, you are representing your words, but the problem is a number two doesn't know, should it be related to number 1000 in the vocabulary because it is closest to that or no? So that's the type of problems that we want to address. Another type of representation that you see a lot for words is that if this is your first number, you can create a very long vector having the size of your vocabulary. Let's say you have 1 million words or 1,000 words in your vocabulary. And then the first entry is 1. The other entries are zeros. You, these are called one-hot vectors. The second word is going to be there is a 1 on the second entry of that vector. And the rest of them are zeros. But again, this has the same problem. It has actually one more problem. The first one is that it's not talking to the words in its context. And the other problem is that these are usually very long vectors. So it's gonna be a 1000 uh, dimensional or 1 million dimensional vector with a lot of zeros. So we are looking for a different way. Our problem is that we want to include the context and we want to have a shorter vector. So we are looking to represent each word with a vector of numbers. Wouldn't another problem be with um, like changing vocabularies? Like as new as new words enter the English language, like how do you add that into our existing embedding with one hot vectors? Then you'd have to, I guess, extend them all. Yes, that's also a great point, uh, and we are gonna try to address that in the next papers. Cool. So yes, that's also a very important comment. But for now, our problem is trying to represent them with vectors. And let's just uh, get started with the skip gram model. In machine learning and deep learning, you usually have four components. One is your data. The other one is your model, what type of model you're writing. The other one is fitting the parameters of the model to the data, that's called training. And for training, you need to write a very good loss function. So the question is, what is your loss function? And in the end, once you train your machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm, the question is how do you evaluate it? How good is your machine learning framework? How good are the word representations that you're coming up with? So keep this in mind. So there are gonna be four components. The first one about data, what type of data do we have? Can somebody answer? Discrete. So your data is gonna be you scraping the web for instance, it could be all of the documents on Wikipedia or all of the documents on the internet. All of the news documents, all of the uh, comments that people are writing for reviews of, a, of an Amazon product, etc. These could be your data, okay? So these are a bunch of sentences. So your data is in the form of a bunch of sentences and your sentences are something like this. 
it's a set, it's a sequence of words. So the order matters. So that's your corpus, that's your data, that's your corpus. The model that you're writing, you are trying to represent each word with a vector. That's our model. And what is gonna be our last function? This is gonna be your last function for escape gram model. What does it say? It says that you pick a word, WT is a word, in your entire corpus. So there is a question, does the order really matter 100%? You can switch a few words and the sentence will have the same meaning. So that's correct also. It's not perfect. And that's why it's a hard problem. It's unlike what we are used to in uh, usual scientific computing, where things are perfect. Here, there are no perfect solutions. It's not gonna be 100%, okay? Does that answer your question? So let's see what this last function is telling us. It is telling us that you pick a word, let's say representation, and your problem is to predict the word to the left of it or to the right of it. Maybe you take this word and you want to predict the words to the right, maybe two of them, and two words to the left. So that's gonna be your context. So you pick a word and you want to predict a bunch of other words in the context. T is going to be a word in your corpus, small t, and then you're going up until capital T. That's the entire size of your data set. It's all of the words that are appearing in the corpus. Okay, So you're doing an average over all of your data, all of the words in your data, and then your problem is to model this probability. And you want to increase the probability of the words that are in the context and at the same time try to decrease the probability of the words that are not in the context. Okay, so that's, that is this summation. Log is not going to change anything. It's an increasing function. So if you maximize this function, you are maximizing the probability. And the question is why average? Because you usually, there is usually the assumption on your data set that they are identically and independently distributed. So if you want to write down the probability of your entire corpus, there is gonna be a product over your entire corpus. But once you take the log of the product, you're gonna end up with the summation of the logs, okay? Log of product is equal to summation of logs. Does that answer your question? That's why you're getting a summation. And this one over T is just a constant, so it doesn't change the maximum value by context, so there is a question, what do you mean by context? Is C the window of words you want to predict in the sentence? Yes. So I guess this figure is gonna make things more clear. You pick a word, maybe this word here, that's gonna be your word. And then your problem is that you want to predict the words next to it, the words in its context. So maybe you want to predict of and representation, and you want to predict and and phrases. So does that answer your question, Acer? And there is another question. Is the mean counterpart of the geometric average as if we took the product instead? So yes, whenever you want to maximize the likelihood, you can either maximize the likelihood, which is gonna be the product of a bunch of probabilities, or you can equivalently maximize the log of the likelihood. And whenever you take the log, it's gonna turn product into summation, okay? So that's a problem, but I didn't tell you what the model is. I told you what is the loss function now. Now the question is how are we gonna model this probability? We need to introduce parameters. We need to parameterize our words. So let's try to do that. We are gonna represent each word in our vocabulary. So W is the size of our vocabulary, and we are representing each word with a vector. We are representing distributed by a vector, maybe it's 100 dimensional vector and it can take real values. So it's a 100 dimensional vector. WI is, the, is just an index, okay, in the dictionary. Maybe distributed is the 100th word in our dictionary. So we are associating a vector to that word and that's the input word. So WI is exactly this WT here, is exactly this WT here, that's the input. And then we are gonna have another vector representation because we want to give our model a little bit more flexibility for it to be able to optimize. We are gonna associate another vector for the output words. And the output could be this word here. If you multiply two vectors together, 
you're going to end up with a number. This is a dot product. Whenever you multiply two vectors together, you're going to get, and if you do it a dot product, you're going to get a single scalar. So this is just a single scalar. The problem is, this is not a probability. This can take a value from negative infinity to positive infinity. But we want to turn that into a probability. And the probability is going to take values that are positive. So if you want to make something that is from negative infinity to positive infinity and make it positive, you usually take an exponential. The exponential is going to make it positive. Okay, the first problem is solved. Then a probability is always from zero to one. That's why you are dividing by a term that is bigger than the numerator. So this is your denominator, that's your numerator. And this is called the softmax. This function that I'm writing here, exponential divided by this summation of all of the words in our vocabulary is gonna give you a softmax. This is gonna be a value from zero to one. Okay, now this is a probability. And one thing is worth noting that uh, you have W words in your vocabulary. So you have a vocabulary size. And at the same time, you have a corpus size. So I don't want you to com confuse those two together. This is your data set size. This is your vocabulary size. Your data set could be in the order of billions of words. Okay, so T is in the order of billions. And W could be in the order of uh, ten thousands or millions. Okay, That's the number of words that you're going to have. W, the question is, what is V prime? It's just another vector. It's just a notation, V prime is another vector, the same way that V was a vector, V prime is a vector, okay? So now this is a probability. You can plug it in there and then you try to maximize that. What are you maximizing over? You are maximizing over V and exactly the question that we just had, V prime. So you're maxim these are the parameters of your model, V and V prime. And the question is, what is transpose? The transpose is you have a column-wise vector and you're making it row-wise. So this is a row-wise, this is a column-wise vector. After transposing, it's gonna become a row-wise vector. And then you're gonna multiply that by a column-wise vector and then it's gonna give you a single number. This is one by 100. The other one is 100 by one. If you want to think in terms of matrices and then that's gonna give you a single scalar. But the problem is that the scalar is from negative infinity to positive infinity. And by taking exponential and dividing it by the summation of the other exponentials in your vocabulary, you are turning that into a probability. So these are your training words. And that's exactly what I just mentioned. T could be the size, is actually the size of your entire data set. It's all of the words in your data set. C is the context, how many words to the left and how many words to the right are you looking at? WI is exactly WT. WO is one of these. It, it, it could be any of them. So it's WT plus J and J could be negative two, negative one, one or two. W is your vocabulary size. VW is the input vector representation for W. For instance, if your W, if your word is compositionality, VW is gonna be its vector its corresponding vector. So each word is gonna have its corresponding vector. So there is a question, what is the dimension of the vector V? That depends, it's a choice that you make. You can, it could be 100 dimensional, 256 dimensional, or it could be 1024 dimensional. It's a choice that you make. And there is another question from Dennis, if P of WO conditioned by WI is equal to one, does that mean WI is always followed by WO. Uh, so there is a difference. What you're looking at is, uh, first of all, it's never going to happen. It's going to end up being one in your data set. But there is a difference between what is happening in your data set and the model that you're writing for the data. Maybe there is a word in your uh, corpus that is always followed by that or preceded by that. But then that's, your, that's what your data is telling you. That's what the statistics of the data is. But this P that we are writing here is a model for the data. It's never going to be perfect, but first you write a model and then you plug in your data set inside your model. That's going to give you your likelihood that you are maximizing. And once you maximize that, you're going to end up with uh, your vectors. 
So does that answer your question? So there is another question. I do not understand the model's diagram given a word. We are predicting the probability of its context words. Exactly. So given a word, you want to write a model for the probability of its context words. Given the input word, you want to write a model for the probability of the output word in the context. Once you write a model, once you parameterize it, you can start try to maximize your likelihood or minimize your loss function. And there is another question, but the context size would be fixed. Yes, each model that you write is gonna have a bunch of parameters. So these are universal for machine learning. Any model that you write is gonna have a bunch of parameters. It's gonna have a bunch of hyperparameters. And what is a hyperparameter? This context, the choice of C, it could be one, two, three, four. It's a choice that you make, okay? So C is a hyperparameter. V's and V primes are parameters of the model. Now the question is, how do you set the parameters? You set the parameters by maximizing your likelihood, okay? How do you set C? You set it by choosing a validation data set. So you usually divide your data set into training, validation, and testing. On training data, you are gonna train your parameters. So always associate training data with parameters. The hyperparameters, you're gonna use your validation data to set them. So you can choose what is C depending on your validation data. And then before you put your model, your machine learning model into production, you test them. That's why you need to have some test data. You first test it and then you put it into production. So that's how things are gonna work. You use the, your validation data set to set C. You use the training data to come up with the best word vector representations. And then once you have an algorithm that's giving you the word representations, you can put it into production. But first you need to test it. Uh, what is the reason for taking the log of the probabilities? That's a great question. And the answer is sitting right here. You have an exponential. Once you take its log, the log is going to cancel the exponential. And then you're going to end up with a nicer objective function to minimize or maximize. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's only because we're using softmax with exponential. Uh, we usually use softmax, but it's usually easier to take the log. It's going to put your values in a nicer position. So it's going to make the objective function easier to optimize. So by taking log, you're making life easier. So there is a difference between the theory and the practice. So once you sit behind the computer or deep learning, you're gonna keep staring at your loss function going down. You're gonna get used to it. And then uh, sometimes your model doesn't converge for numerical reasons. And one of the numerical reasons is that you're not taking the log. And another reason for taking the log is that it's gonna turn a bunch of products into a summation. And once it turns into a summation, you can do a stochastic gradient descent. So rather than doing the summation over your entire data set, let's say you want to write a for loop that has the size of your entire data set. It's gonna be billions of words on the internet, okay, in your corpus. It's gonna take you forever to compute a summation. That's why you usually do it in mini batches. You don't care. All you need to know is a gradient with respect to the parameters of the model and you want to have an estimate for the gradient because then you want to do gradient descent, okay? Then you can do uh, 10, 10, 10 sentences at a time and then try to optimize 10 sentences at a time. And then computing these summations are gonna be much cheaper. So there are two reasons. About, I told you a couple of reasons for why you need to use log. Uh, let me read the chat again and see what other questions there are. So yes, in this case, we are maximizing the likelihood is it? So that's the question. Yes. So we are maximizing the log of the likelihood. And then there is another question from Lucas. So would every possible word have a probability at position WI? So the position WO and WI are exactly, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence in your vocabulary between, for instance, the word distributed and number 123. So there is a one, one, one by one co uh, correspondence between these integers and the words in your vocabulary. So this is always the 100th word in your vocabulary, okay? And W and WI are the indices corresponding to these words. 
Does that answer your question? Um, sort of. I'm just wondering, so you're base, are you just basically calculating a probability for every other word in your training words based off the word of the current index? Yes, exactly. So you're modeling. Let's say you have the word representation for distributed, and then you have a word representation for representations. So these are two words in your vocabulary. And then you have a corresponding VW for that word. You have a V distributed, V representation, V of, V words. So for each word in your vocabulary, you have a vector. Now you want to turn those vectors into probabilities. If I give you this word here, can you tell me what was the word next to it? What was the word right left to it? Two words left to it or the word right next to it? So that's the model that we are writing. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So the question is, what does maximizing the likelihood mean? Maximizing the likelihood is uh, equivalent to maximizing the log of the likelihood and then minimizing the loss is going to correspond to minimizing the negative of the log of the likelihood. So that's what it means. And what is the output? The outputs are these uh, probabilities. That's your output. This is your loss function. And then uh, the output of the entire algorithm is going to be a bunch of word vectors. OK, let's continue. So we are going to have an input vector representation for each word in our vocabulary. We are going to have an output vector representation for each word in our vocabulary. These two could be equal. They don't have to be different. Uh, but if you make them different, it's going to give the model more flexibility. And in the end, we are going to choose one of them. We are going to say, OK, we are going to represent distributed by V of distributed rather than V prime of distributed. Then once the model is trained, you're going to end up with a vector representation for each word. What is uh, a typical size for W, at least for this paper, this was in 2013, it's around 10 to the power 5 or 10 to the power 7. That's a typical size of W. So we, we had a vector representation up until now for each word. Somebody might say, I might have a phrase like New York Times. If you... Uh, break New York Times into New York Times when you're doing your training, then this is going to have a different meaning compared to what we are used to. So New York Times is a journal, is a newspaper. That's what we associate in our minds to this phrase. But then if you break it apart, New York Times, it's going to lose its meaning entirely. So this, what I'm going to tell you here is just trying to add a bunch of phrases to our vocabulary. So we want to treat New York Times as a word, as a single word. And the stages that I'm going to tell you right next to it is uh, just a pre-processing step on your data, OK? We are going to associate a score to each pair of words, each pair of consecutive words that are appearing in our corpus. For instance, New York. This could be New York. This could be York. Then you're going to do a count. You go in your entire data set and count the number of times that these two words are appearing next to each other, like in this case, and the number of times that, are, that they are appearing in different locations individually. You count them. That's going to give you a score. And if this score is bigger than a threshold, you're going to include New York in your dictionary. OK? So this is a pre-processing step. It doesn't have anything to do with our model. It's a pre-processing step. Can I ask real quick, uh, is that count of WIWJ term, mm -hmm. um, is that like dependent on order? So that's different than WJWI? Yes. So it's different. So okay. we are not considering New York new. We are con con considering New York. Okay, cool. Okay, so far so good. You count them. And it's easy to count. You go in your data set and then you say, count the number of times that New York appears in the uh, corpus. And then you can do a simple count. And then if it's bigger than the threshold, you're going to include New York as one of your words. Yes, this is a pair of words, but it could have a meaning of its own. So we are including that. And many of the words are going to be below the threshold. They are not appearing next to each other, so we discard them. This was one round. We are going to do another round of the same thing, okay? 
now in our dictionary, we have the words New York and New York. So we compute the score for New York times. So now WI is representing New York and WJ is gonna be times. Again, you do the count. If it's bigger than the threshold, you are gonna include that in your vocabulary, otherwise you discard it. And it turns out that if you do it for a couple of rounds, it's a good algorithm for giving you these phrases. So now we are increasing the size of our vocabulary. Not only we started with 10 to the power five or 10 to the power seven terms, we are adding a bunch of phrases to our vocabulary. Is this just TF-IDF? No, it's different from TF-IDF. So TF-IDF, we usually use it for classification. You're gonna go over that, so don't worry about it, but it's different. And what is delta? That's a great question. And delta is just a discounting coefficient. So in the end, what's gonna happen, this is gonna be bigger than or equal to a threshold, let's call it T. Let's multiply count WI, count WJ by T and keep it to the right side. So now you're just putting some flexibility for the model. You don't want this inequality that you're writing to be too strict. So it's just a discounting factor. And again, it's another hyperparameter. Delta is a hyperparameter, C is a hyperparameter. Uh, the size of your vocabulary is another hyperparameter. So these are the hyperparameters of your model. Okay, perfect. But we have a catch. There is a problem. We have a problem. And can somebody tell me what the problem is? And it has to do with the computational cost. What is wrong with this model that we are writing? So what is wrong with this probability? Mathematically, everything is fine, but computationally, there is a problem. Yes, exactly. So that's a great point. So you guys are mentioning that when W is big, and W is literally really big, okay? It's order of millions and above. When W is big, you're gonna have to write a for loop to compute this summation each time that you have, an, have a word in your corpus. So this is computationally expensive, computing that. You're gonna do a lot of for loops. Your for loop is gonna do a lot of iterations of order of millions and billions, okay? So this is expensive. This, this is not a problem when you're doing classification for maybe images when you have maybe 1,000 images to classify among. But here it's a problem, this is big. And then it's gonna make your algorithm very slow. So there is a way to turn, to reduce the cost from W to log two of W. And whenever you see log two, there is the trick for that is usually a tree. And that's gonna be your tree. So you're gonna create a tree. And then log two is coming from having two branches each time. Okay, but how is it gonna give us the probability now? How is it gonna help us reduce the cost? So just keep this figure in mind. And let me tell you what is NW1, NW2, NW3. NW1 is the first node on the path from the root to the word that we're interested in. L of W is the length of this path. So the length of this path is, uh, is four actually. So it's gonna be three plus one. So that's the length of the path. NW1 is the root of the path. NW4 is the word that we are interested in. So you have NW1, NW2, NW3, NW4. Let's say CHN is always the left child. So this is, you fix a child, and for now let's fix it to the left. So CH of N, any node, is gonna be the one to the left of it. And we're gonna turn true and falses with this double bracket into ones and negative ones. And then we're gonna write down our probability. So this is our probability. This is what we're interested in. This is our probability. This is our probability. Here is another formulation of our probability. First of all, why is it more efficient? Don't worry about the terms here. Why is it more efficient? Because you're doing now a product. So you're gonna have a for loop that is gonna have this many iterations in it, LW iteration. And LW is exactly what you have here. It's the log two of W, so these are equal. LW, the length of your path, is gonna be log two of your W, okay? And now let's try to expand this for an example, for this example that we have here. And let's say you want to know the probability of W given an input, 
for the input word, you have a vector, WVI. You take W, sorry, VWI, you take VWI, multiply it by the vector here for this node. So now each node is gonna have its own vector representation. You multiply it once, and this is gonna tell you, should I go to the left, should I go to the right? This probability here. And sigma is just a number from zero to one. It's a sigmoid function. Should I go to the left? Should I go to the right? With what probability are we going to the left? With what probability are we going to the right? Same thing here. With what probability are we going to the left? What to the right? With what probability are we going to the left or right? Okay? So I guess I'm going to continue this next session. Uh, but for now, we have three more minutes. And this is enough time to tell you why do you have a negative sign here and why do you have positive sign here and where they are coming from. The positive sign is for going to the left. The negative sign is, the, is for going to the right. And there is a cool prop property of the sigmoid function that sigmoid of x is equal to, sorry, one minus sigmoid of x is equal to sigmoid mm. of negative x. That's why you have a negative sign here. Basically, this is one probability, and then the other one is one minus the other probability. So this is probability, this is one minus probability. And it makes sense. It is either to the left or right. It's one minus the probability of going to the left. And this child here is just a mathematical formulation of coming up with these pluses and minuses. Because on this path from the root to the node to the word, we are going one time to the left. So that's a left child, that's a positive. Then you're going to the right, that's a right child, that's a negative. That's why you get a negative here. And then you go to the left. And that's gonna model the probability and it's gonna have the cost of log two of W. It's gonna have the cost of this L. I think we are out of time. For those of you who want to leave, you are more than welcome to leave. And for those of you who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. And there are actually some questions in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. The question is, does it matter how the tree is structured? The answer is yes and no. For no, it doesn't matter how you create this tree, is that you're always gonna end up with this cost. It's gonna be log two of W. So it doesn't matter. You just create your tree and it's gonna give you this cost. If you want to do better than log two of W, yes, it matters maybe you can assign shorter path to more frequent words in your document, okay? And then it's gonna be much shorter for, the, for those paths. And then it's gonna be much faster for the frequent ones. Exactly, so it's gonna be called Hoffman encoding, and it's actually what we are gonna cover next session. It's gonna be binary Hoffman tree. So you're gonna assign shorter code to more frequent words. Perfect. Did I miss any questions? Have I answered all of them? There was a question in there about what the nodes are, but I guess the answer is that they aren't anything. What only matters are like the the leaf nodes. Uh, yes, in the end, what's going to matter is these VWIs, but then that's actually a good question. We are sort of trading off computation. We are doing less computation for more parameters. So now you're associating more parameters. Each one of these nodes is going to have its own parameter the prime of notes. Mm. Okay. So is the idea we're grouping words together. So we're almost having the number of words or getting rid of like half of them and then the next node we're even like further narrowing it down. So you're just kind of instead of checking the probability of every word, you're kind of checking the probability of groups of words. Yes, that's a very good way of putting it. Uh, by going to the left of this at this node, by going to the left, you don't have to consider the ones to the right of it. So you don't have to do any operations on them. So you got rid of that. And then by going to the right here, you're getting rid of the ones to the left. So yeah, that's where the computational savings are coming from. How do you build the tree so it properly, each subtree is like a proper, is the right group of words? So there are actually algorithms for giving you the Hoffman tree and binary trees in general. Okay. So that's the solved problem in computer science. There are algorithms that's going to help you. You give it your entire data set, actually your entire vocabulary, and then it's going to create the tree for you. Okay, so don't worry about that. Is this probability formula with uh, the products from one to LW minus one, is it 
um, dependent on the fact that the tree that you build is a proper like binary search tree, or would any arbitrary ordering allow that formula to be true? Uh, so any binary tree is going to give you that. It's going to okay. give you this cost and it's going to solve your problem. But then you can make it more efficient by doing half trees. Okay. And I had a second question. The, the word embeddings only exist at the bottom layer and everything until then is, uh, I guess I'm, I'm confused about what is stored at like NW2 and NW3. So at NW2, what is stored is still a vector of the same size. Maybe Let's say your size is 100. Yeah. So this is going to be a 100 dimensional vector, but this is going to be V prime. Okay. For these nodes, you have V primes. For your words, you're going to have Vs. And the ones, the, the V primes are kind of like just, I guess, computational intermediates. And we don't, we don't use them after this thing has been trained. Exactly. So that's a great point. Once the training is done, all you need to store and give your customers are these V of WIs. Got it. So you give them an embedding matrix corresponding to your dictionary. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, why is the vocabulary size different from the num I mean, the number of training words? Because the same word, for instance, distributed, could appear in this sentence or another sentence in your document. So there could be many sentences that can have the word of in it. That's why. So basically, training words are just all the terms, like tokenized terms. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So it's going to be, you go through your document, sentence by sentence, and word by word. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have a corpus, it's a large corpus of all of the documents, for instance, on Wikipedia. And you go line by line. Oh, I saw this word, and I'm seeing it again in this sentence. I'm seeing it again in another sentence, etc. That's where this summation is coming. So you could be and... the same input word multiple times. Okay. And... I mean, in this probability uh, function that we have written in uh, initially uh, under this objective function that we have written, how are we encoding uh, that a particular word was at a distance of say two words from WT? That's a good like, So we are not. This model is okay. not doing that. Okay. It doesn't matter whether it's the second word to the left or the first word to the left. It matters only that it's in the context, but that's a great point that you're making. Okay. There are actually models that take that into account, but this is just uh, a starting point for us. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks.